be. But me, your man, Louis T. Welcome to the command post. Post up. Take command. I, of course, am your commander in chief, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. Continued coverage of Commander's Camp. Day number seven, the second day in pads. We start off with the injury report from practice today. Um, a big change. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. But um, some of the things we talked about yesterday carry over into today's practice. Uh, James Smith Williams, JW, uh, JSW, uh, still out nursing the hip injury. He was on the bike uh, today, but uh, again, not a participant in practice. John Bates, side field, along with Troy Apke, Trap was on the side field today. Um, undisclosed injury there. Don't know the severity of it. Don't, don't think it's very serious. Uh, no Deami Brown in practice today. He was noticed having a sleeve on his leg. Uh, did not practice today, but was out on the practice field, but did not participate. So again, don't think it's anything serious, but you know, something to keep an eye on. Uh, however, what was a serious injury, which is why I'm donning all of this black uh, linebacker Drew White, undrafted rookie out of Notre Dame. I'm a Notre Dame Fighting Irish fan. I was really rooting for Drew White to make an impact and potentially make this football team. He is now lost for the season with a torn ACL. And so his season is done. They will put him on IR and we'll see if they give him an opportunity to compete for a roster spot next year. Uh, uh, but the big news out of the injury um, uh, news for the team it was that of Curtis Samuel now. Ron and Curtis have both, you know, stepped to the podium and Ron went out of his way today to make a uh, mention of the plan yet again. Uh, so they talked about the plan and how, you know, w he won't be practicing every single day. This will be a ongoing theme throughout camp that they're not worried about, you know, camp nor the preseason, nor should they be. Okay, I've, I've been an, I've been a staunch supporter of I don't really give two ham sandwiches about, you know, preseason nor a training camp. I'm worried about getting him ready for September. Okay, that's my biggest goal is to have him ready to rock and roll week one Jacksonville Jaguars at the crib. So and that's their goal as well. And that's what the goal should be. And not just for that game, but the other 16 that follow. So um he practiced today. You know, he, he practiced. He was he participated in individual drills. He looked good and fluid. He participated in seven-on-seven seven drills and the 11-on-11 11 11 drills. So he was a full participant in all of the individuals and for much of the team periods. He did not, however, participate in one-on-one -on -one drills, but that's not a big deal, okay? So it was good to see him out there. Um, and this is going to be a consistent theme. There will be two or three practices. He won't practice. He'll be on the side field. He'll be getting his work in with the trainers. And then, boom, he'll pop into the practice, and he'll get his work in. He'll look good. Hopefully, the, the key, and Ron used to say this all the time last year, and I think this really rings true for a guy like Curtis Samuel, the key is how does he feel tomorrow? Is there back tightness? Is there hamstring soreness tomorrow? That is the key. You want to stack as many of these types of days on top of each other with no lingering effects. That's been the problem with Curtis Samuel is he'll come out, he'll run, he'll look good, he'll tell us he feels good. The next day he feels like garbage. He's tight here, he's sore there, and then you're going through this process again. So the key will be how does he feel tomorrow? Got a nice bit of work in today. How does he feel tomorrow? We won't know. Okay, I don't think we'll. he won't be available to the media tomorrow, and I don't know if any of these – reporters are perceptive enough to ask Ron, hey, how did Curtis Samuel feel after yesterday's session? I, I don't know if they're going to be thinking in that light, but that's something that I would ask, you know, is, you know, how did Curtis feel? Because you said it yourself last year multiple times. It's not necessarily the day of practice. It's the day after. How do they feel? It, you know, and Ron loves when you regurgitate the things that he says over and over again. So anyway, that's not important. I digress. He practiced today. He looked good, no setbacks. Let's hope that that continues throughout the rest of camp when he does participate. So uh, yesterday I talked at greater limbs about the punt return situation and, and kickoff returner and, and how that uh, kind of 
folds all the way into the receiver position and, and that last spot that I think is available, that sixth and final wide receiver spot is going to be designated for the punt and kick returner. And Ron went out and said that guy needs to be able to handle both duties. I think that guy also has to be able to play receiver at a respectable level and be able to contribute should his number be called as well. Can't just be a guy that is solely there on the basis of being a kick and punt returner. So um, you must add more value. We talked about uh, some of the guys that I think are in that mix, and we'll see more of that as we get to the preseason games next week. However, today I want to focus on a different position. Today I want to talk about the tight end position because obviously Logan Thomas is a guy that we don't think is going to be ready for the start of the season. And the assumption is Logan Thomas, similar to Chase Young, is probably going to be out for the first, you know, one, two, maybe three weeks of the season. You're hoping to have him back at some point within the first month of the season. So obviously with that going on, him not participating um, in practice right now, and, and he's out there and he's going through, you know, his, his rehab situation, but he's, he's present. And we'll talk about that with Cole Turner a little bit later on. However, um, he's not going to be a guy that factors into the 53-man roster from a, um, you know, if so they've got a decision to make. And this will tell us how close they feel like he is as we get closer to the season because they have to make a decision. Right now he's on IR, right, as is Chase Young, as is, you know, um, some of the other guys, Cole, uh, Chase Rouye was on uh, IR. His backup, uh, Tyler Larson, those were the guys that started out on the pup list, right? Chase Rouye has been removed. He's back practicing with the team. And the other three still remain, Logan Thomas being one of those three guys. If they leave him on the pup list, that means you have to miss the first four games of the season, mandatory. If they think he can be back by week three, then you don't put him on the pup list. So that will tell us, how far you know away they think he may be to coming back. But that said, it's a tricky situation because if you keep him on the roster despite knowing he won't be able to play the first two weeks, that's going to impact another position on the team because you're going to have to keep three tight ends you know, that are active, right? You're going to have to keep three tight ends that are active on the roster, and you're going to also have... Logan Thomas that you're carrying as a fourth tight end. So that's going to take away from another position that you may want to ultimately keep to start out the season. So it's going to be interesting to see how they maneuver around, you know, Chase Young, whether he's ready or not, because if he's not ready and you put him on the pup list, then you have that extra roster spot to keep an extra defensive end. If you think Chase might be ready to come back week two or week three, then you don't put him on the pup list. And therefore, now there's an extra defensive end you're carrying in Young that won't be ready the first week or two. And now if you keep another defensive end as depth purposes, you're taking away from another position. So this is when those pup lists, you know, uh, guys start to really impact you. So it'll be interesting to see. But I said all of that to say this. I don't think Logan Thomas is ready for the start of the regular season, which puts Washington in a position where if you're going to keep three tight ends active, which you always want to have three active bodies at the tight end position on game day, he's not going to be one of them for the start of the season. Who's going to be that third tight end? And, and honestly speaking, if we can stay relatively healthy at the tight end position, this guy will be your fourth tight end, your de facto fourth tight end, the first guy that you call up off of the practice squad should you need an extra body. But I don't think they're going to keep four tight ends. I think they're going to keep three tight ends. Now, if Logan is a guy that's they're not comfortable having on the pup list to start the season off, then they may keep four tight ends, right? Keep Logan active so when he's ready, you can just plug him in. Uh, but I want to talk about that, that third tight end without Logan, the fourth tight end with Logan, right? So it's a really interesting competition. It, it's really three guys because when we look at the tight end position, it's Logan Thomas, Cole Turner, and John Bates. Those guys are locks, right? They're a separate category. They're in a separate discussion because we know they're on the football team. The next three guys are vying for really one spot. Now, they may be you know, looking forward to working with two or three of these guys, all three of them or, or just two of them, but one of these guys is going to have to at least be on the roster come week one more likely than not. So 
who is that guy? And you have to trust this guy. Should he have to play? Can he come in and give you meaningful snaps? You know, whether it be week one or it be week eight, because I, I think that same guy is going to be TE4 essentially. And the first guy off the bench, should you have an issue with any of the other three throughout the course of the season? So there's three guys vying for one spot, I believe. There's Curtis Hodges, undrafted rookie out of Arizona State. There is Amani Rogers, undrafted rookie out of Ohio. And Sammy Reyes. And this is a guy going into his second season, but having never played football until last year. So each of them bring a different set of skills to the table, which makes them unique. I'm, I can't wait to watch. I think this is one of the positions I remember on Rio show, uh, Rico talking about wanting to pay attention to the tight ends. I'm fascinated with this position group as well because it's going to be interesting to see how these guys try to nail down a roster spot or at least put themselves in a conversation for the first guy off the bench should something go awry. And from a blocking standpoint, Samis Reyes is uh, head and shoulders above Curtis Hodges and Amani Rogers. Okay. That's the skill set that he brings to the table. Physical, you know, probably a little bit further along in, in, in a technical aspect because he was here last year, even though there's a new um, tight ends coach in, in Juan Castillo. But he, he's probably a little further along in angles and, and you know, footwork and all that stuff. Um, but he lags in the pass catching department. He's not fluid. That was the thing we talked about last year is like, when you get ex basketball players, you want these guys to be extremely fluid as an athlete catching the football in and out of routes. Sammy's Reyes just looks mechanical from that standpoint, and he struggles catching the football consistently. We saw that last year. You know, you thought maybe it's just a bit of nerves. No, I think this is just something that he struggles with at this current moment. So that's going to hold him back. They want guys that can also have an impact in the receiving game, and Sammy's Reyes right now is way behind the curve from that perspective. But as a blocker, he gives them a little bit more physicality. And in, in, from a technical standpoint, he's a little bit further along than the two undrafted rookies. That said, uh, Amani Rogers, I think, is the most fluid receiver out of these, you know, this trio of, of guys vying for, you know, that, that last tight end spot. And he catches it seamlessly. He's a natural athlete. But this is a guy that is extremely undersized and making a positional change from quarterback to tight end. Look, they're very well versed, obviously, in the conversion tight end. We have Logan Thomas as a conversion from a quarterback to a tight end. And obviously, they were working with AGG before he retired. And Cole Turner is a conversion tight end from wide receiver to tight end. So they're well versed in the conversion tight end universe, right? The, the problem here is, is that he's 225 pounds, right? He's 6'5", 225 pounds, 230, somewhere in that neighborhood. He's a smaller, undersized tight end. Yeah, he can help you as a pass catcher, but he is lagging right now in the blocking game severely, okay? And this is not going to be, hey, we can work with him over the summer. This is, hey, he needs all year to work as a, a blocker, whether it's in the run game was a pass protector to get up to speed. And he needs to get his weight up too before we can probably feel comfortable throwing him into the mix. So I think that's going to be the thing that holds him back is he's just undersized and he isn't where he needs to be as a blocker. But from a fluidity standpoint, pass catching ability, route running ability, he's probably the most natural of this group and gives you probably the most production as a pass catcher right now. Um, and then you go to uh, Curtis Hodges, uh, who I think who is to me the odds on favorite right now uh, to be that TE three. If Logan can't go and they're going to keep that extra tight end um, to start the season off. And the first guy that they would call up off the bench from the practice squad, should something go awry with the first three guys, I think it's Curtis Hodges. Now he's six, eight, 245 pounds. So he's got the size. Okay. He fits in that mold of the tight ends that we have. Logan Thomas is a 6'6 guy. Cole Turner is a 6'6, 6'7 guy. So he fits in that mold of the size of the tight end that they like. John Bates is a 6'5 tight end. So all of our tight ends are huge. They're trees, right? He fits into that mold. He's 245, 
sure, he could probably fill out his frame at 6'8". He could easily be 250, 255, probably 260 at that frame, at that size. But, you know, 245 is good enough if he knows how to use angles, use his hands, and, and position his feet. So he's an adequate blocker. He's got a ways to go, but he's solid in that department, and he's a solid pass catcher. Again, not the athlete that Amani Rogers is, right? Not even the athlete that Sammy Reyes is, but he's more functional and much better of a pass catcher than Sammy Reyes is. And he's a much more sound blocker at this point, especially with this size than Amani Rogers. So you get kind of a, a little bit better version of those two guys com you know, combined into one. Lesser of a receiver than Amani Rogers, lesser of a blocker than Sammy Reyes, but, you know, better than each of those other guys' traits where they where they're weak. So he kind of brings together a, a blend of, hey, I'm not great at anything. I'm good at everything. And he gives you size as well. So I think he's the one right now that has the best chance to make the football team. But again, when these preseason games take place, uh, practice is huge, obviously, but these preseason games are also going to ha have a huge say in who a uh, is able to separate themselves at the tight end position. I think it is a position worth watching. And uh, right now I give the nod to Curtis Hodges. So one-on-one -on -one drills. We talked about one-on-one -on -one drills yesterday. One-on-one -on -one drills from the offensive line and defensive line yesterday. We talked about some corners versus receivers. Today I want to talk about specifically running backs versus linebackers. Had a chance to look at this. Um, and watch the entire one-on-one -on -one drill period between running backs and linebackers. And um, I really want to focus from the standpoint of the, the running backs. I mean, these one-on-one -on -one drills, a lot of times, it's more so set up for the offense to be victorious when the defense wins. It's a, it's a big plus for them. Uh, but this is really set up for the offense to win. They know where they're going. Obviously, the, the defender doesn't. He's reacting. So it's tough. Um, so the one-on-one -on -one drills consisted of pass protection. So in these drills, the running backs aren't allowed to cut, which you are in, in an actual game. And the um, linebackers aren't allowed to bull rush. You have to use a move. You're not allowed to bull rush. So each of these you know, positional groups are somewhat handicapped by what they can do because a, a huge part of pass protection is cutting guys, right? That option does exist. And in, in, in the case of a linebacker, we saw Cole Holcomb a couple of years ago blow up um, uh, Ezekiel Elliott, you know, when we played Dallas. That's a part of, you know, being able to rush is to just run through a guy. That's being taken from you. So you want to see some finesse. You know, you want to see a guy make a move and maybe have a counter to that move as well. You just want to see these running backs be able to protect. Keep a guy in front of you. Keep your quarterback clean. Do whatever it takes to keep him with, you know, within the, the framework of the rules. Don't want to see guys holding. Uh, I thought J.D. McKissick was outstanding, right? which we said he's our best pass protector right now. I thought, you know what? Antonio Gibson looked pretty damn good. Uh, both of his reps, I thought he held his own. Uh, I thought he did a good job of moving his feet. He did not lunge. I thought he did a good job of not holding. When that guy tried to spin to the inside, he did a good job of redirecting him, and then he let him go. He did not hold. Um, I thought he did a really good job. If, if that were a real rep, that the quarterback would have been able to get the football off. Uh, Brian Robinson, on the other hand, <laughs> he struggled a little bit. Uh, th that's an understatement. The first rep, it wasn't terrible, but it wasn't great. The second rep was horrendous. The, the guy literally ran right by him and would have gotten to the quarterback and probably forced a fumble, you know, if that ball's not out. So um, he, he, he olayed, he whiffed. Uh, so he's, again, it's a rookie. These are the things you expect. And as soon as it happened, I saw, you know, running backs coach Randy Jordan run right over to him and, you know, talk to him and tell him what he did wrong and how to correct it. So these are teachable moments. This is what you want. You want these mistakes to happen now so that when you get in the game, you may be able to alleviate some of these mistakes. Um, as far as the route running one-on-one -on -one between running backs and linebackers, um, J.D. McKissick is so nasty. He put a vicious, flavor delicious um, – move on Jamin Davis where, I mean, it, that's not fair. I'm, you can't ask Jamin Davis. And really, no linebacker in the league, I feel like, can cover J.D. McKissick, which is why he's one of the best in the business in the past game. I mean, it was so nasty. It was a, it was a simple 
you know, in and out type of move. It looked like he was going to run a slant. Then he pivots, turns, goes back outside, and, and Jamin Davis was lost in the sauce. And I couldn't blame him. Uh, th- that's an impossible move to cover because JD's one of those dudes that doesn't stop or slow down to make a cut. So it's all one seamless transition in, out, bam, bam. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, boy, he was open. There was some separation, okay? Um, Antonio Gibson. Um, you know, went up against Cole Holcomb. Holcomb did a really good job of getting into his body at the top of the route and taking it away. Um, so Cole Holcomb run, run, uh, won that rep. And uh, Brian Robinson uh, was able to, to, to get a, a reception. It wasn't the cleanest route, but he was able to separate, get the win uh, against the linebacker that he was matched up with. So um, it was nice to see the one-on-ones, nice to see them in pass protection, nice to see them running routes. And... Um, you know, that's going to be something that we continue to talk about. Some of these one-on-one drills, as now the pads are on, you're going to see a lot more of these taking place. Uh, so now let's get to the microphone portion of um, the show where we talk about what guys had to say after practice. Obviously, you get Ron after practice. You get two guys randomly that they choose to make available to the media. Those two guys today were rookie Cole Turner and veteran corner Kendall Fuller. We'll start with Ron. A um, couple of interesting nuggets from Ron today. Um, the fourth defensive tackle uh, position. We, right now, I, we talked about this briefly, I think, a couple of episodes ago where we don't know who that guy's going to be. And I think I think it was yesterday that I mentioned uh, David Bada, who is in the IPP, the International Pathway Program, and how he looked good in some one-on-one drills. Um, and, and so that's a guy to, you know, keep an eye on. Daniel Wise is a guy that we've talked about. I talked about him all off season and I said, look, I don't know if I'm comfortable with Daniel Wise being our, you know, third defensive tackle. I think I'm comfortable with Daniel Wise being our fourth defensive tackle, but not comfortable with him being third. Obviously that, that's no longer the case for Darian Mathis is here. We don't have to worry about that. So him being the fourth guy, I think may be okay. Um, and Ron talked you know, glowingly about Daniel Wise and went out of his way to mention him. So I think right now he's the leader in the clubhouse for that fourth defensive tackle spot. Remember, he was here last year. He played in regular season games. So they're very comfortable with Daniel Wise. And if he continues to play well this camp and into the preseason, he probably will lock up that fourth and final defensive tackle spot. Linebacker, Ron talked about that position because Drew White was injured so obviously that's another guy down at a position that we were already not necessarily happy with the depth at. And so Ron's like, I actually like what the young boys are doing, man. I like what the young fathers are out here putting on tape. However, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, kind of really looking at the situation. I'm in constant communication with our NFL scout to see what's out there for us. I already told you, I think he's going to be AJ Klein when it's all said and done, man. I, they're going to bring some veteran in here. Ron said this about a month ago where he said, you know, you know, I think I want to add a veteran to this group. I think they're going to ultimately do that. A lot of you thought, it, you know, we kept saying Anthony Barr. I don't think it's going to be Anthony Barr. It's going to be someone that's familiar with Ron's defensive scheme. It's going to be someone he's coached in the past. It's going to be somebody like A.J. Klein. It might be John Bostic. Like, these are names you need to keep in mind. I know you don't want to hear that. And we already got enough of these ex-Carolina Panther retreads, but – A.J. Klein is the guy that I keep mentioning. He's out there. He's right in that mix, you know, and uh, someone yesterday said, hey, he, he brought up David Mayo, and, and he did. You know, I, 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 you know I, I caught wind of it, talked about them. So they were in their big package, meaning down by the goal line, you put extra bodies on the, on the field, big bodies. So, you know, when you're trying to stop the run, it, it's third and goal from the you know, two yard line, this is when you bring in all these defensive linemen and linebackers, bigger bodies, guys that can stop the run. And he said Mayo performed well in that period of practice. So I I don't put too much stock into it, but yes, it, David Mayo isn't going anywhere. He's making this football team. So um, I, there's nothing to be alarmed there by. I mean, this is what we expect, right? But he did say that they are, you know, kind of analyzing that position and monitoring that situation, they're going to bring someone in. I really feel that way. I think that they like what they're seeing from some of these young boys, but it's not enough to stop them from bringing in a veteran. At some point, I think they're going to add a veteran. Um, Kendall Fuller. Um, I told you, I think he's one of the smartest players defensively on this football team. He's very cerebral. 
that's part of the reason why no screens usually wide receiver screens work on his side of the field. He he knows splits. He knows what teams are trying to get to by formational looks. And that's because he does his film work. He does his study. And he talked about that at the podium today. Uh, but the two things that stood out to me in the conversation that he had with the media today was he talked about juice playing in the slot. And apparently this is a real thing. Like I've been somewhat dismissive of this because I'm like, eh, it's a big dude. You know, yeah, he's got some foot speed and some quickness, but I, I don't know if it's good enough to play in a slot. And like Kendall Fuller's like, uh, yeah, this guy's actually legit. And what he does is he offers that length and physicality up at the line of scrimmage that's going to really be problemsome, you know, and, and worrisome for some of these, you know, smaller receivers. Now, also, he's he got to factor in that those guys are quick, and if they win off the line of scrimmage, he could be in a lot of trouble. So it's going to be interesting to see. I, I, I want to see this. That's always been my thing is I, I need to see this to believe it. Right now, I'm not buying it. I need to see it. But, um, you know, he's like, yo, he's been impressive. I tell you what, you know, Benjamin St. Juice, and obviously Kendall Fuller having played in the slot can offer a lot of advice. It's the same thing that Bobby McCain was saying earlier in camp. Like, look, I've, I've played just about every position in the back end you could play. So if any of these guys need help, I'm there for him. And Kendall Fuller is very similar in that he's played just about every position on the back end and he can really help. And, and, you know, mentoring a guy like Benjamin St. Juice, who's now making that transition from boundary corner inside to a slot. So he talked about that. He also talked about Jahan Dotson as a route runner. And he's like, yo, this dude is advanced beyond his years. He's like, some of the things he's doing, you just don't see that from a rookie coming into the league, you know, very often. He's like, it, I'm not saying that you never see it, but you don't see it very often. He's like, one thing I can tell you, from in the spring, uh, he ran a route one day, then the next day he ran the exact same route and it looked exactly the same and then he broke me off and it was something that you see from veterans. You know, you don't see that from young guys, you know, running the same route but running it totally different. So it's, that's, again, this is why we talked about him being a professional coming in. I told you, he's a professional wide receiver day one, he steps in and he's gonna produce. And that's why I felt like Washington felt so good about him because of where they are in their process. They need to win now, and a guy like Jahan Dotson needs to win, uh, helps you win right now because he can come in and produce right away. So the excitement level for him is through the roof. Cole Turner, you know, this is the first time we really got to hear from Cole Turner uh, speak, and I, I, I like the young fella a lot, and he talked about his relationship with uh, quarterback Carson Wentz and how, you know, they've developed – a, a, a relationship, you know, on and off the field. He's like, hey, you know, Carson was really good to me, you know, when he first got here and I got drafted. Um, you know, when we went out to L.A. to work together and then, you know, coming back here, he's kind of taking me under his wing. You know, he, he said he's a jokester, so he's a guy that, you know, keeps things light, but – He's like, this is a guy that anytime I have a question I can go to, you know, we talk about things. We're building a rapport not only on the field but off the field. So uh, that's great to hear. You know, Carson has always had strong relationships with his tight ends, and uh, it looks like Cole Turner is going to fall into that category here as well. He talked about Logan Thomas being a mentor to him. He's like, Logan is out there for every team period, and, and anytime, you know, I have a question, I can go to him. And, again, Similar backgrounds from a, you know, making a transition from a different position standpoint. So Logan's giving him all the pointers and he's like, I really, really do appreciate the, the fact that he's able to do that. And he's like, also, you know, John Bates, you never want to see anybody get hurt, but him being out of the lineup these last few days is giving him more reps. He's like, you know, the best way to learn, and I think we can all attest to this, is via reps, you know, the doing something over and over again allows you to get better at it. It's hard to take mental reps and, and just get better from that standpoint. Actually getting out there and doing it, getting the muscle memory, these things help. And so he's like, you know, getting these extra reps have been very beneficial. And he's talked about learning the playbook, which is always tough for a rookie, especially a guy coming from a system like the one Cole Turner came from, where there's not a lot of nuance to it. You know what I mean? It's an air raid system, not a ton of blocking. You're running a lot of routes. And so he's like, this one is a lot more complex than what I'm used to, you know, coming from what I came from in college, where it wasn't that difficult. This is, is a lot for me. And I'm still learning. He said, but the biggest thing I tried to do was come out here 
and not make a ton of mistakes. And I haven't really done that to this point. So uh, I haven't made a lot of mistakes. Uh, so I feel good about that. But, you know, it's a constant grind. I'm continuously learning every day. I feel like they're adding more things in. So I'm having to stay after practice, write these plays out on the board so I know exactly what I am responsible for in that play call. So he's like, I'm learning the playbook. It's tough. I'm not going to lie. But I'm, I'm getting help from some of my peers. And I'm continually, you know, putting in the continuously putting in the work to try to be up to speed and sharp on what my responsibility is. He talked about the run game. Remember, again, didn't do a lot of run blocking at Nevada. He said, look, you know, the biggest thing for me is angles and footwork. I got to continue to work on that every single day because that's what's going to ultimately help me. But I, I, I have the want to. I have the mentalities like everybody in the room does, which is a good sign. And so, you know, to me, blocking, I've always said blocking is like rebounding in basketball. It's all about want to. You don't have to be the biggest. You don't have to be the fastest, the strongest. You don't have to jump the highest. You just got to want to rebound. Same thing with blocking in the NFL. You don't have to be the biggest, the strongest, although those things help. But you don't have to be the biggest, strongest. You just got to want to. And if you can figure out the technical aspect, you can be a very proficient blocker in this league. So Cole Turner seems to be putting in all of the work that is necessary to get himself on the field a lot sooner rather than later. So that's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T. Day seven of training camp, second day with pads on. I look forward to chopping it up with you guys on Thursday night live as we will go over that day's practice. But more importantly, talk about the overall big picture as we start to get closer to preseason game number one so so many different topics to dive into thursday night live hopefully you'll be able to join me but until then i am a washington fan etched in burgundy and gold my washington spirit will never die washington spirit will never fold until we meet again you know what it is post up and take command you guys have a great day i will see you guys tomorrow night for the command post live Louis T. Network.